Hey guys, welcome to TRW Pizza. In this video, I'm going to be talking through the topic of leopard spotting, what it is, how I think it might work, and do an experiment around leopard spotting to see if I can work out how to make it happen each and every time. Um, I hope you enjoy this. It's an interesting one with me, and the, the result at the end is quite intriguing also. Enjoy. So first and foremost, what is leopard spotting? It's basically an aesthetic effect on the crust of pizzas where there's a, the carbon deposits or, or little burnt spots on the outside, as you saw there, which essentially give this, as I say, quite aesthetic look to it. Although, personally speaking, I don't search for the leopard spotting. I don't, it's not something which I class as the hallmark of a good pizza. Yes, it can make it look nice. However, um, I do not class a pizza based on whether or not it has leopard spotting. And that's one of the underlying themes of this video. You might use certain techniques to try and achieve it, but do you really want it consistently? Do you need it consistently? I personally don't. However, for those who do want to understand a bit more about it, I did this experiment where essentially I am cooking six pizzas over the period of two days. The dough has been um, dry fermented in the fridge for 48 hours when I make the first batch of pizzas. And then the dough will have sat for the next three pizzas for a further 12 hours in the fridge. Now, the reason why I've done that is because I believe that the extra fermentation may well give the likelihood of leopard spotting um, an increased, uh, basically increase the, the likelihood of leopard spotting developing. So let's see, this is the, this is the, the, first, the first of the first three pizzas um, coming, coming out of the... Uh, uni stack there, you can see that the dough itself isn't overly developed. It's yes, it's grown since I put it in 48 hours earlier. It was a nice compact dough ball originally, and now it's kind of spread out across the bottom of that stack. But it hasn't blown up, it isn't big, and it definitely isn't over fermented. Um, it's coming out of the stack there nicely, and you'll see what the pizza looks like shortly. The dough is actually easy to manipulate. Um, isn't too elastic, I can move it around easily, and it generally it's the kind of dough that I like working with. So yeah, my hypothesis is that this pizza is going to have less leopard spotting than the pizza I make 12 hours later with exactly the same technique. I'm going to use obviously the same dough, the same cooking duration, the same heat, um, same toppings, just in case that makes a difference. You'll notice I, the only, um, as you watch this, you'll, the, the only time I apply oil to the, the the pizza itself is just with the cruet at the uh, at the point just before it goes on the peel for launching. Um, I think I have thought in the past, and maybe some people have thought in the past, that leopard spotting is due to a brush or, or deployment of olive oil on the crust before it goes in the um, in the in the oven. I I have got no indication that's the case because. I'm getting leopard spotting even if I don't put any olive oil on the crust of the pizza. So I discount that as a, um, as, a, as a cause of leopard spotting. I think it's more to do with the dough itself, but as I say, I don't know for a fact, and I'm going to explore this further. I really enjoy working with this dough, which is 48 hours in the fridge. It's also been out in the fridge now for about an hour and a half, but yeah, it just works well. It just essentially, um, you can see it, it can be hang, hung off the back of my, my knuckles there and doesn't risk giving any, any holes or any very thin patches which might end up being a problem when it comes to putting the toppings on or launching it. It's pretty robust, but it also makes a cracking pizza. And this is where, I guess for me, it's the sweet spot. I, um, I think, you know, just 12 hour direct, uh, 24 hour direct dough Still makes great pizzas, but I think it benefits from that extra time in the fridge. This is the, the sweet spot for me, and you're about to see why as it goes in the oven. Um, on comes my sauce. Sauce, always the same. I always tell you that, you know, for months now, I've only ever used the Muti uh, cherry tomatoes with sea salt in it from Campisi. Um, hand blend it, and then it is uh, ready to go. No herbs, no garlic, no cooking. Goes straight in. There's, there's some freshly grated Parmigiano Reggiano. 
that's the foundation of the of the topping. I bought a block of dried mozzarella, which I've cut cut up into about centimeter cubed um, squares, and that's going on. Not too much, not to overdo it. It's uh, ideally this is what I'd use every time, rather than the kind of pre-grated packaged stuff. But sometimes that packaged stuff is all you can find, and there's no actual. Uh, big drama if that's the case and you use that because it still actually tastes good it just has that anticoagulant on it which um, stops it clumping together and basically introduces more um, let's say uh, more things into the cheese that's unnecessary essentially you know making it a little bit more processed and that's what I try and avoid if at all possible and then I've got some pre-cut and drained buffalo mozzarella there went on top it's DOB, DOP stuff really good and then these huge huge basil leaves these aren't the ones from my uh, balcony that I've grown myself these are ones which um, I got from the shop and they're they're very big and I don't know I, I tend to think not quite as tasty um, with most things in life when it comes to cooking I think the smaller ones have have more taste anyway this is the pizza that resulted from that. You can actually see quite a lot of leopard spotting. Those carbonated bubbles are coming out. And um, and actually, this is honestly one of the most highly leopard spotted pizzas I've had in a while. I added some prosciutto straight on top of this and some rocket. And then this lovely balsamic glaze, which has a little bit of truffle in it, just because I like, I like that to go on top. And then here's the, the second pizza from that batch, which again has a lot of Leopard spotting on it. Hey guys, so here we are. This is the second day of this test around creating leopard spotting. Now, yesterday you'll have seen these um, dough balls that came out of exactly the same batch, exactly the same recipe. Nothing has changed whatever, whatsoever apart from, this is 12 hours later. So yesterday's were 48 hour um, cold ferment. And now these went in overnight again. I did bring them out. Um, for an hour yesterday out of the fridge, but these are cold ferment again overnight. You can see significantly more um, bubbling, they've got bigger, they're starting to blow up a bit. Now my hypothesis is that these are going to create even more leopard spotting. So we went from 24 hour direct dough to 48 hour to then an extra 12 hours later. And I think incrementally each time we've got more leopard spotting. So let's try this to start off with. This isn't coming out of my uni stack because I used the uni stack for the ones which I cooked yesterday. That bubble was so big, it came up and touched the actual cling film. This um, is not the ideal receptacle for pizza dough. It's not perfectly round, which will cause me some problems with getting the Pizza itself perfectly round, but I think I can work with it. I have done in the past. Let's see if I can uh, prove it on camera. <clears throat> Ease it off from the sides. I do try and bunch it into itself to get it more round while it's still in there. But yeah, just remember the, the principle of this is that I'm doing nothing different compared to yesterday's pizzas to today's pizzas, just the dough has been in the fridge an extra 12 hours. Let's just spread that landing pad out a little bit. I'm starting to use my Tipo 00 flour for the landing all the time now, rather than the um, semolina flour, because I just find the semolina flour has got a propensity to burn in the, um, in the uni a little bit more. And hear that coming off nicely. We'll flop it down. Almost there. Almost there. It's on. There we go. So let's have a quick look at this. Yeah. From the underside, it's uh, got the you can see quite a lot of glutinous ventricles in there. Okay, let's <clears throat> get it shaped up a bit. Get that flower either side because this thing will, will not launch well if it's wet. 
that is the golden rule that I'm learning to see that it's basically the wetness of the flour destroys the launch, gets the pizza stuck on the pizza stone and ultimately causes me personally problems and I'm sure that's the same for everyone else as well. So you can already see the difference in the way that this pizza dough is, is moving and that the way it's sitting, it's gonna be much, much easier to stretch. It's not holding together as much. I'm probably not gonna to have to do the kind of drag it over my knuckles method, but I will anyway, just to make sure this is absolutely the same approach to yesterday's pizza. I want consistency. I can feel that there's more air sitting in the center of that pizza. So here we go over, over knuckles just very briefly. I don't want to risk getting any holes in there. Now, one thing I do find, which might be against tradition and, and kind of classic pizzaiolo advice, is that when you have a dough that's pretty stretchy like this, because it's been on the longer ferment, ferment, that's when you're going to have more problems bringing it over to the actual peel like this. So, what I do is I move it to the peel where there's more risk of it, when there's less risk of it it's stretching because the toppings aren't on there. Then it comes across. Then I put the toppings up. Actually, I'm gonna have to take that off again because, rookie error, I didn't put any flour on the peel itself, which is important. It really is important. Over it comes again. Now, if I moved that across when all the toppings were on, it would have stretched like that, but also caused me a problem that the toppings would have got stretched on the top. You'd have cheese bunching up here, you'd have your basil everywhere. And I don't like having to rearrange that on the peel personally. Some people are expert at it. I just, I just find it's unnecessary um, hassle that can be avoided if you get your pizza nice and round on the peel itself before adding the toppings. Now you know I have a golden rule I'm gonna do a video about my golden rules of pizzas that, that I found personally. Make sure the pizza's round on the peel there, and then just make sure it's moving nicely. If that was wet anywhere, it would be sticking and it wouldn't be moving like that. And that would be a problem. So here we are. I'm pretty much happy with the shape of this pizza. I'll admit I haven't enjoyed manipulating it as much as I have, as I did with the pizza dough last night. I pre prefer having Yesterday's pizza dough, that kind of slightly, uh, let's say, less, elas um, less elastic dough that hasn't been dry proof, quite, uh, cold proof quite so long. Anyway, on goes the sauce, same sauce from yesterday, just been in the fridge overnight. On goes the Parmigiano. grows the dry mozzarella which was in a block which I cut up this morning again exactly the same I used yesterday you know what the pizza is looking kind of similar but you got these you got these folds and things so I'm gonna do a an up close video shortly but you got these Let's, let's show you. We've got these folds, like around the edges here. It's just not as it's just not as nice, regimental looking, and smooth. That is because I believe it's had that extra fermentation, and ultimately, is is it's just moving around itself too much. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing; it's going to create a bad pizza. I'm just saying that's a fundamental difference. Um, I'm using my homegrown, balcony-grown basil right now because the basil I was using yesterday has wilted quite a bit. And then this wonderful cruet, which I got for my birthday. Just add a little bit of olive oil there. Let's have a look at this pizza. There you go, let's go cook it and see how it looks. Okay, so here we are with this wonderful 
Margarita, is it moving nicely on the peel? Yes, it is. It's ready to go. Let's check the temperature. We're talking about 430-ish in the center of the in the center of the uh, oven here, which is roughly where where I want it to be. You need to be careful that I'm not going to burn it. So the, the flame's been on high for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So I don't want to land the pizza back here. I want to land the pizza roughly here, although it's never going to be perfect. If I do feel it's burning, I'll bring it forward to the right a bit. So let's get it in there. Let's hope that this lands smooth. I'm just going to give it a slight tweak on the shape. It wasn't perfectly round. Okay, so here we go. Wish me luck. And it goes. Happy with that. It went a little bit further back than I wanted it to. But, um, but let's see. My general approach is it can sit there for 30 seconds and then I'll move around. My daughter helping with the, being the cameraman, doing an excellent job. That pizza's starting to rise nicely. At the back, and we're looking for rapid spotting occurring, more so than it did yesterday. I do get the feeling that that stone's quite hot, so I am being careful. Let's have a look underneath, it's all right. It's looking a little bit anemic on this side, so I'm going to present it to the flame. And pull it out. What do you think of that? Looks nice. So there's the margarita. Let's, um, I tell you what, I'll do some filming outside of the actual pizza itself. Let me just uh, get it on a board. Stop it. Okay, here we are. Here's that pizza we've just cooked. What I'm going to do is show you its anatomy, basically. A lot of people ask to see inside the pizzas that I cook and the underside, which I haven't actually done for whatever reason to date. So what I'm gonna do is first of all, cut through and show you the, the underside of it better. Here is the, the underside of it. I think that's pretty good. There is um, some charring there, obviously, but certainly not to a, to a level which I would say is uh, an issue. Next I'm going to cut through a cross section of the pizza where there's some more crust so we can see how fluffy it is. Because obviously if you skim through that with the pizza cutter itself it compresses the crust and you can't really see that fluffiness so much. So I've been through that section, let me do the rest with the cutter. Wow, it's still very hot. So, here we go. Um, lots of lovely air pockets in there. I think you'll agree. I'm gonna take a couple of photographs. So there we are. There is that cross section plus the underside. Now, one of the main reasons of this video and experiment was to discuss leopard spotting. How do you get more leopard spotting? My hypothesis was that I'd get more leopard spotting with this pizza than yesterday. The honest answer is, I haven't. I'll do a uh, quick comparison now. I'll flash up some of the, the pictures from yesterday's pizza, pizzas and no, there isn't more leopard spotting. Yes, we have some. Um, this is probably the most leopard spotted area of the pizza but that isn't as much as, as yesterday so okay hypothesis um, buried I think 
I'm going to make two more and see if it's consistent. But yeah, I don't think that's the answer, to be honest with you. Yeah. Okay, so here's pizza two. Same approach as last one. It's, I think it's getting stuck a bit in the middle here. Let's see if it launches well or not. You see, that was where it was stuck. Lift it off the bottom now just to get that last bit of cooking. Yeah, I think that's good to go. So here's pizza number three, margarita with the uh, same approach. <coughs> this one's moving nicer again. You'll notice it's not sticking like the one was, so it will go straight in. But this is certainly not a bad pizza by any <coughs> test of imagination. Here we go. So let's have a look at the underside of this last one. I was happy with it uh, from what I could see. Let's try not to drop this. Yes, that's good, happy. So now it's just a case of garnish. And serve garnish, of course, with the greatest herb out there. Fresh basil on top of cooked basil. Always do it in a way that looks good. Trust me, it makes a huge difference. And we're good to go. What do you think? I'm happy. So yeah, in culmination of this video, I think it's fair to say that there was absolutely no correlation, in fact, an opposite correlation between the longer ferment and extra leopard spotting. They're just different. Yes, there's some leopard spotting on these um, pizzas that came out 12 hours later compared to the 48 hour dough, but not as much. So it's not that. Um, so we need to keep on experimenting. If anyone's got any ideas, please drop them in the comments. But yeah, I hope you found this interesting. I certainly did. But remember, guys, I don't think personally that leopard spotting is a key uh, factor in a good pizza. It just looks pretty, but isn't critical.